isn't the, the movie theaters and the RIA and the NPAA behind them. It isn't a Spotify, again, with the RIA behind it. It isn't these major corporate entities that are trying to control what you can do with technology in your life, what you can learn about, who you can talk to, what you can say, etc., etc. And this week, as I may have mentioned on Facebook, this is a little bit of a later show than normal, so none of my invited guests couldn't make it. But even so, there was, I, I kind of got stuck waiting for other people to finish their laundry. Kind of a bad call on my part to try to do laundry before the show, but I really do need clean pants, so that is kind of important to me. In any case, I want to get into a couple of things, but the first thing I want to get into this week is I forgot something last week. I played a whole bunch of songs, and some of them were pretty good, really, really good to listen to, but I didn't really mention where they came from or who they were, other than that they are free culture, or part of the, the free culture collection of songs that you can uh, go out and download or find on your own, and that it's legal for you to do that. It's not illegal for you to share this podcast or those songs specifically. And so I'm just going to bring up my list here to remind myself exactly what was played last uh, week here. Uh, I was thinking, actually, you know, it would be handy to have a second screen for, for cases like this. But in any case, so the first one wasn't actually the song, though the one thing that wasn't perhaps licensed as Creative Commons, although it's old enough that it was kind of meant to be shared on Rant Radio, which, of course, this is a kind of descendant of, which is To the Ranting Griffin. Uh, to the Ranting Griffin is a comedian. He's a professional comedian. He makes a living coming up with funny shit, and not just on the internet, but in person, and, and especially in some kinds of conventions, for, for conventions specifically. If that's not a thing you're really aware of, that's okay. If it is something you're aware of, you may have already heard of him. He is that big in those circles, and has made quite a name for himself in in pushing the boundary of what uh, people kind of find funny and uh, like any good comedian has has just sort of been on that edge that nice edge of between funny inappropriate and so on and so forth and I think he's done a, a fantastic job of keeping himself on that edge and uh, I, I haven't heard much from him recently but he's a cool guy so if you are interested go out and uh, if you're interested in laughing see if you can find his stuff because it's Funny as all hell. The other thing was Porn on Beta. I've played Porn on Beta a couple of times. Porn on Beta, of course, is the one of the bands that was part of the Rant Media empire <laughs> of sorts of uh, independent and alternative music that inspired, again, this show. So Porn on Beta, again, released a couple of albums. Go grab them all. Unfortunately, I don't know if you can buy them anymore. I think it, it might have just been possible to buy them in the past, and I don't know if you can still give them money. But if you can, definitely do so, because they're pretty good. The other one was Biza Dash, uh, which, I, again, I think I've played one of their songs before, too. French folk band, and uh, they are, I believe, Creative Commons as well. Then there's Maria Panzeri, who is one of the... Actually, uh, may even be listening to this show. Uh, she is around on my Facebook, so if you're interested in more of her stuff, uh, there is more of it to be found. It was on Agnula once upon a time when that surface was still around. That surface appears to have died out long ago. And then there was uh, Wistiti, 
uh, which I think I, I linked to with Titi's uh, Bandcamp page. They have a whole album of which that, that's probably my favorite song on the album. But it's actually a pretty good album. It's kind of like a concept album, I think, with, I think it's Into the Eye of the Vulture or something along those lines. And it's it's a pretty good album and well worth the listen. And of course, free for you to download. But I think in Bandcamp, you can, I think you can still send them money. So if Bandcamp uses the kinds of payment systems that you have access to, by all means, but of course, they don't accept the really useful ones that most of the internet can actually use. So that's kind of unfortunate. But still, still a good band. I don't know if they've done anything recently. It might be worth checking out. And then, of course, the other thing that was technically not Creative Commons and which got my video banned from both Facebook and probably would have been YouTube. I, I just clipped it off without even se- <coughs> clipped it off before I sent it to YouTube because uh, I knew full well that YouTube would immediately hit my uh, channel for that, uh, which is unfortunate because like 10, 15 years ago, when YouTube was really new back in the 2005, 2007, I'm not I'm not exactly sure which year, but one of the years about 10 years ago or 15 years ago, it was really common for people to play that song everywhere that you could possibly play it. I heard that song in lectures in university where people would, as part of a class presentation, like on page 35 of a 50 point PowerPoint slide would play that video just to mess with us. And it was, it was just the sort of thing that you hear it and you're like, oh no, I've been pranked, right? It's, it's just a, a, a thing that uh, was so widespread that everywhere you turn, everywhere in the world you would go, someone was trying to play that song. If you had access to a, a source of a video, a TV screen, anything that allowed you to control what was on it, the very first thing you put on that TV screen was that video. And so for those of you who are too young, perhaps, to remember how widespread that was and how just like spread out on how many different kinds of media and sources of information would play that video just when you weren't, when you were least expecting it. It was really, really common for that to happen. And that particular song by that point was pretty much obscure. Like it was it was a hit back in the 80s or early 90s or whenever it was released. But then it kind of died down because, I mean, it's an interesting song, but it's, it's not really, nothing really that special about it. Except for this, the internet phenomenon that took the world by storm and brought it back. This was, of course, a 4chan creation. This is one of 4chan's earlier impacts on the entire world, uh, where they, they started it and everyone else just sort of followed along with them. And it became something that most people don't even necessarily know is a 4chan thing. And yet that was possible because there's this space for people to, to, to coexist and to share culture in an anonymous, freewheeling and uh, just free way. And one of the things that came from that was this, this tradition, this cultural tradition no different in form than Christmas or Easter or anything like that, only just playing a video once in a while, of course, when people aren't expecting it. And just waking people up that, oh, hey, yes, the media you consume, it could be anything. It could be total garbage. It could be used by someone who is interested in taking advantage of you, like on, for example, television. You see commercials all the time that are trying to manipulate you into buying something or spending money on something or doing something that you wouldn't normally otherwise do. And in a strange little way, that video kind of helps you see that, oh, hey, yeah, right, I should be paying attention to the media in my life and what it's doing to me and who has control over it and who can say what plays and what doesn't play. And so with that in mind, and hopefully now that you've got your kind of critical thinking and satire uh, detection cap on, I'm going to play the most controversial thing I'll have played to date on this show. Technically speaking, I am pretty confident that this is not actually Creative Commons, uh, or th- that it would be a mistake to classify it as such. However, if you pay a little bit of a Tension, you might see why I might play it anyway. And so, again, th- this don't get yourself sent to jail over downloading this, this podcast, but nevertheless, enjoy.
You got my goat lined up with the barrels of a tandem ten gauge. But there's a note on the mirror saying no more rage. I took a pill and hit the rod before the sun hit the beer cans. And I think that I would make it by noon if you don't have lunch plans. The first time I arrived, as I rolled into the drive, I was flying. And if you were to say today the thrill survives, man, you wouldn't be lying. Like any other food that's played with fire, been a few more than twice bit. Now it's clear I'll move sleep down from here Any way you slice it Been good for nothing since I first Got a wish I can't imagine what would have happened If As if I never made it to Bigsville And I'm going to Bigsville I used to be the kind to look and go at any time in any weather But now it seems it's often quite enough If I can put two thoughts together As from a ball in that town that I, I belong to And I'm praying hard that nothing's gonna break My thread I'm holding on to Good for nothing since I had a whiff I can't imagine what would happen if I never made it to Bigsville and I'll see you in Bigsville Sandwich and the soup de jour. Cause I've had my sights set on the hamlet that's the heights for sure. Each time I rest my head upon the bosom of a bird that has no fear, I feel the faint relief from the eyes on the
So that last one was uh, Joel Arendt, Biggsville. I've been kind of looking for information on Joel Arendt. I know you can still get his music. You can go on Amazon, and Amazon's got it. I personally wouldn't recommend buying music from Amazon at all, but if you're interested in his music specifically, uh, which is free culture available for you to listen to and to share with your friends, at least there's a way to give him money. Giving artists money, of course, is a historically difficult thing. Actually, it was kind of interesting this week. I re-watched an old Richard Stallman talk, and I may talk a little bit more about it in a later show, and I may uh, play a little bit of an excerpt from it even. Uh, but in 2009, uh, Richard Stallman went from uh, university to university all across Canada, and he even came to the University of Regina and gave a talk, which was interesting, uh, not uh, perhaps his best talk, but he gave a talk uh, r probably right before that in Calgary, at what looked like a law school in Calgary. And so he tailored his talk a little bit to his audience, which was a, a good idea. He w didn't focus so much on the technical side, which he did seem to focus on a little bit at U the University of Regina because it was the computer science side that had brought him in uh, on that side. But the, it was a persuasive attempt at solving changes to copyright law that were kind of in the pipeline in 2009 and have since passed. The ratifying of the WIPO Copyright Treaty here in Canada hadn't really been done yet. And so there, there was still this chance that we could have avoided a lot of the problems with copyright that would have come later. That's not really what I want to talk about or mention though here. What's interesting is that he uh, made the point then of how difficult it was to reward artists directly back in 2009. Now, keeping in mind, back then we had PayPal, we had Ripple, we had, I think we still had eGold. eGold was dying by that point. The, the nail uh, was not in the coffin, the, the garlic wasn't really spread around it yet, it was still on its last legs, but you could still send musicians eGold. And there was an, another uh, eGold-like system, I think it was something like a pound, I think it was run out of the UK. I signed up for it. I think I made a couple of bucks on it, but I never actually saw the money because payment systems were not hooked up so that people around the world could just send money to each other easily. Yes, there was a Western Union, and if you wanted to spend a whole bunch of money sending money across the world and having a huge delay and actually going to a Western Union shop and doing all this paperwork and having to worry about them looking into your personal background and possibly having the money lost on the way, then yeah, you could do it. So like you could buy a CD, for example, and this is, this is why CDs were so one of the reasons why CDs were so popular is you could do this and you could uh, the effort required to just go out and buy a CD was proportional to the amount of effort it would take to just go and send money to the artist directly and at least at the end of the day you got a little piece of plastic with the artist's artwork on it right whereas Richard Stallman was imagining a system imagining a way for um, especially anonymously so that you could get away with it without the government knowing what kind of music you listen to and without the RIA being able to control who got what kind of music and being able to redirect the music from the, the musicians to the record labels and all that sort of thing. And just have a system where you could, an artist could put up some kind of an address or a link or something, and then people could hit a button and then that button would just send a dollar to them. And then he was talking about how maybe there might be public service campaigns if such a system existed where you could encourage people, have you sent a dollar to a musician today? And if you're, if you're that poor that a dollar is really going to break your bank, just whatever. But a lot of people aren't that in dire straits, right? You, you, can, you can probably afford a dollar. Like, I definitely can afford a dollar. But I know some people who are in some pretty rough shape, and even they usually can spare, like, one dollar, right? I mean, yeah, you can get into a situation where that, that last dollar really matters, and I've been there. But, a lot of, again, a lot of people aren't. And so, do you really need that dollar? Or would it be better today... To send that dollar to a starving musician who could probably use it to further their art and to, in this system you wouldn't have to worry about it being scarfed up by a record company which is of course what they tend to do to take money first and foremost from their artists and Richard Stallman actually even talked a little bit about the mechanics of how they do that and the the, the way in which when you sign a record contract with an RIA label they'll actually make it so that Unless you're an established artist, you're probably not going to make money, even if your song becomes a hit. And so this is probably true to this day, that even with Spotify kind of taking a little bit of the position of the middleman out, there's still 
a huge gap between people enjoying the music in their lives and being able to reward the artists. And so it may make sense on a financial level to just go and download the song and send a dollar to using you know, some anonymous internet payment system to the artist directly if they accept it. They'll be further ahead if more people do that. So if you're listening to this show and you know an artist who takes Bitcoin, a musician that you enjoy, well, first of all, if there's some musicians that you enjoy, especially if they're free culture musicians, then go check if they accept Bitcoin because Bitcoin is the ideal implementation of what Richard Stallman was talking about in 2009 when he came up with this idea. Now, maybe it's actually, ideal is probably a strong term. We don't have a button on our desktop that will automatically send that, that bit sent to an artist if they need it. But the payment side is there and it's ready for such a thing. And it's probably like a first year university project at this point to implement. So it, it's worth thinking about that we have the system, we have the capability now. Does your favorite artist take Bitcoin? If they don't, why not? So with that in mind, the next thing I, or sorry, then the other thing that was played, of course, was Weird Al and don't download this song. So I guess we really shouldn't download that song. We shouldn't listen to it. We shouldn't share it. We should definitely not mess with the RIA and take the song's advice for sure. So while that's going on, uh, there was other things I wanted to talk about. The first is, again, I just wanted to briefly mention, I'm not going to play the clip, but there was a, a clip I was listening to of uh, Brain Damage, a uh, radio show from the 1980s put on by the same guys, uh, people, or I guess, who do uh, Off the Hook Now on WBAI New York uh, Radio Now. Back then it was WUSB Radio New York. And uh, one of the things they... they uh, encountered was one of their callers had this problem. And I seem to think it was with the phone company, but it could have been something else. It, it really doesn't matter what the problem was. But the, the, the net result was that they had run into a barrier where the bureaucracy involved was just not budging. And it was completely unfair what was happening to them. And it was outrageous what was going on. And so they said something. They, they, they had some advice for the person who was call, calling into their show with this particular problem. And the advice was, well, go write it up into a letter for your local newspaper, and they'll publish it, and then the public will get out, outraged, and there will be some public pressure put on this big corporation. Now, the problem here is that what has happened to our newspapers? As I experienced earlier on in this year, when I tried to move to Saskatoon, and I assumed that newspapers would still be fulfilling their role as this kind of information space for the public to be informed on certain things, there there was this gap uh, where when I went to try to rent, and in my case, I was looking for a, an apartment to rent, and newspapers did not have listings of places for rent anymore. Or rather, they did, but they were empty. They were a total ghost town. They've been totally supplanted by online services of some kind. Uh, your Kijiji, your Craigslist, your whatever.com, there were alternatives and there were places still to go. I was not able to use any of them, but they, they existed. But the newspaper itself was no longer fulfilling that role. And I think that the newspapers have also kind of lost this ability to functionally deal with problems in the same way that was suggested in this radio show. And sure, you can write a letter to the editor, assuming they'll read it assuming they'll post it. Back then, it was always uh, hit or miss whether or not you get a letter posted either. But at least there was this expectation that you could, and that it wouldn't just go to some big con corporate conglomerate like post media, who have their own uh, biases. And uh, as kind of talked about uh, when we had the show with Sask Boy, if you haven't seen or heard that show, go, go back and listen to it, because there are problems with the newspapers especially here in Saskatchewan, and definitely out in Thunder Bay, uh, where you can't really rely on them to have this kind of neutral stance anymore, uh, if we ever could. And so this, this idea of, well, at least you can go to your newspaper and get the message out, seems about as naive as the uh, old hacker uh, movies, where maybe if we can get a, a whistleblower to blow the whistle and to have the information go on the internet, at least then the message will go out. Well, we know now that this is this is naive, that 
we have things like internet censorship laws coming down the pipe specifically to prevent this from working. We have things like uh, the ability to trace and track exactly who said what uh, internal to organizations, both government and private, uh, so that we can, or so that the organizations who might have leaks come out about them can, I guess, have some level of retribution against the person who who speaks out against them. And so it, it's a, it's not like you could just write an anonymous letter to your newspaper and then the information would get out. It's there's it's a little bit more serious than that now. And sure, first it was the NSA, the CIA, all, all the three-letter agencies that took a, a, a good look at that approach, but that approach has since spread. And so not only is that going on, but we do have a system of mass surveillance in our society at this point. And it's being used more and more and more. Just this past week, I, I don't have a link to it, uh, but Google apparently got some kind of a subpoena for the phone records of everyone within like this 10 block radius. Hundreds of people, I think it was in New York, uh, all of the records that Google had on them had to be given over and handed over to the court system. And this this particular kind of headline is happening more and more often as people are starting to realize how much data about them is being stored out in the cloud, out in the world, out where it can be sought after by the government and by the court system. And so this is something to kind of keep in mind that there is this, this lack of a, a, a forum where our problems can be discussed. And so, with that in mind, I would like to again suggest that if you do have a problem, get in touch. Maybe we can do something about it. Maybe I can do something with this show. Obviously, Facebook can censor my show. Like, the last show was complete. It's, you can't find it on Facebook anymore. I can still view it, personally. And so I can still play to people. If you can come to, you know, be with me personally, I can I can show you the version that Facebook had. But it was removed. So Facebook isn't the place to go. YouTube isn't the place to go either. Even Mega isn't perfect on this account. Mega has been used for censorship in the past. Uh, it's just the types of things that will get removed from Mega tend to be different than the kinds of things that will get removed from YouTube and Facebook. Now, if I get something removed from Mega, I'm just going to find another place to put it. Like, I'm only uh, dealing with mega Facebook and YouTube right now because literally no one has said that those three sites altogether have been a problem for them in such a way that it seems like I need an alternative so far. However, I'm always interested in finding more alternatives. I've got a Twitch channel, and in particular, this video is actually going to be hosted on Pornhub. Yes, Pornhub allowed me to sign up for an account, and it looks like they're going to let me upload video too. So Pornhub's going to get this show as well. So if, if somehow it gets removed from Mega, Facebook, and YouTube, at least you'll be able to hear this show on Pornhub. Now, again, going back to the whole point of why I'm bringing this up, is because if you have a problem that you would have you don't know where to go. Your bureaucracy and your life is failing you and something unfair is happening to you. Again, get in touch because if nowhere else will broadcast your message in a place where people can see it, maybe maybe this show can and maybe I can do something to help. Maybe I can be that voice that, that amplifies what you need the world to hear. And so this, this show isn't perfect, but this is my offer to you out there who are listening, send me stuff. So, other than that, what else is going on? So, the we've got, I haven't really talked about it much, but I have this project on the go that uh, used to be a project run out of, I think, some kind of a hackerspace in Berlin, that they kind of got bored with it and kind of let it go. And it, what it was, was a list of all the sites that were using Cloudflare, this company in the States, to not host their website, but to sit in between the place where they host their website and the rest of the internet. Uh, so on one hand, you could get a cheaper and perhaps more effective use of bandwidth. So this Cloudflare company has this big pipe of probably lots and lots and lots of fiber optic cables going to their data centers all over the world. And so you only have to show your page to them and then they'll show it to your users and customers or viewers and then the, the idea is that you can't afford 
uh, to be hit by a billion computers going to your website at once, or 100 billion computers. But Cloudflare can. That's their business. That's what they are built for. And so if you've got a, a botnet that suddenly decides that it wants to go to your website every second for like an hour, then Cloudflare can do deal with that for you. And it can deal with it at a reasonable cost. Now, if this was all they were doing, then perhaps there would be no problem with them. But there are a couple of problems with Cloudflare that begin to become immediately obvious when you start looking to see where Cloudflare came from. And Cloudflare came from something called Project Honeypot. And Project Honeypot has this all kinds of interesting things that you can learn about them. And again, I'll go back, I'll come back to this later. We'll talk about Project Honeypot and Cloudflare and how dangerous <laughs> the company actually is. But for the for just the moment, like imagine that there's something wrong with this company worth protesting relating to this Project Honeypot. Now, so I have been maintaining this list. There have been a couple of others, and especially in the past maybe six to nine months, that have really stepped up to do most, of, if not all, of the maintenance on for me in, instead of me doing it. Because I was kind of slacking off, and the project was going very well, but my involvement could not possibly have been enough for the amount of activity required to actually run the project. And so others have been uh, kind of stepping up and getting involved. And the, the amount of people involved kind of increased and increased and increased. Now, a couple of interesting things have happened over the past couple of weeks. One is that someone on the inside of this project uh, turned out to be working for the maybe the other side, maybe some kind of a troll uh, organization, or maybe they were just uh, in for the long con. But for whatever reason, uh, they had access to our repository, and they deleted it and re replaced it with a pro Cloudflare one, which is kind of interesting that they would do that. And then almost immediately, there was comments in the original Tor project bug tracker about our project basically doing an about face and joining the other side or whatever. And so it, it was interesting how seemingly coordinated it was, not just that the, the project got deleted and taken over from the inside. Obviously, the, the list survives. We're, we're still kicking around, although uh, not as active since the quote-unquote attack, the, the deletion of our, our repository. And you could say, okay, well, you know, that's just one troll. That's no big deal, right? And maybe that in that case it actually was. But there's also a, a search engine that uses this list, this project, to, to help people who search for things on the internet make informed decisions about what websites they go to. And so if you, it, it works basically just like Google. Uh, it's called searches or searches. I don't really know how to pronounce it, but, and you go, you do a search and the results come back. And if those results are hosted on cloud, they show as having like a little line through it. So you can know, oh, don't go to this website because it's hosted on Cloudflare. And we know that there are all these side effects of using Cloudflare that aren't normally visible to the end user, but are nonetheless there. And this, this search engine was, uh, had their service revoked this week after years of being running with basically no problems. There, there were, I, I guess, no problems again. It's a little bit of a stretch. Like the, the website it, or the service that it ran on uh, is run on the dark net. And that whole service went down. All the services that were running on it went down with it. In this case, it seems to be a targeted thing where it's just that search engine is disabled. And so the search engine, again, didn't get any warning, didn't get any message, didn't get an email saying, oh, hey, the uh, this search engine went down. And it seems odd that this would happen pretty much the day after the, uh, or, or like very, very shortly after our repository was taken down. So we have our repository gets taken down, our search engine gets taken down, our the search engine gets almost immediately removed from the list of related search engines because it's part of part a, a decentralized search engine network. I can't, I, I'm blanking on the, the name of the software that does this, but the, so within, again, a very short period of time, we had our repository taken down, we had our search engine taken down, the search engine is basically erased from the network of search engines it's part of, we've got all these things, it seems awfully like there's a coordinated attack going on against this project. 
And of course, the project is all volunteer work. It's it's not it's not like I have a full time job maintaining it. And so the long story short is, it, it may be interesting to watch our repository and to see if maybe something else happens. Because Cloudflare is a big company, and they are not above taking steps to protect their image in given what they are doing and who they are in contact with, i.e. the U.S. intelligence services. So uh, it's worth kind of keeping that in mind, that that's possible. The other thing that's been going on that I kind of wanted to talk a little bit about, and I'm kind of running out of time, so I think this is going to be the last thing I talk about, is the old Anti-Terror Act, C-51. And so I just want to read a couple of things from my, uh, about that. Actually, no. We'll, we'll, we'll deal with it. Uh, so I mentioned the other Anti-Terror Act, but it was in 2015. So this is about 14 years after the anti or the original Anti-Terror Act was in place. So we had this, this problematic set of laws in Canada, but at least we had things like our ability to vote. We still had, for most of our life, the rule of law covering what happened. We could still express ourselves. We could still uh, go to protests in public places. There were a lot of things we could still do. And so in 20, around 2015, there was a terrorist attack on the parliament in Canada where a single guy went out and tried to shoot up the members of parliament. Stephen Harper, the pre prime minister at the time, hid in a closet while all the other members of parliament uh, hid in the, the, the chambers where they were normally, barricaded the doors, and the security guards went out and basically killed the guy. And so on the, the downside, because the guy was killed, we can't really know for certain what the story was. He did record some videos that were immediately censored that ex tried to explain why he did it. And it was an Islamic terrorist thing. It was a, at least from what we can tell from those videos, the sort of thing that the Dawa al-Islamiyah has done quite a bit since. And a consequence of Canada's involvement in things like the Iraq War and the American imperialistic wars uh, in the Middle East, generally. And so, long story short, after that, and because Stephen Harper specifically, who had this this control over our parliament and our government, both in the House of Commons and in the Senate, and in the Governor General by that point, he could pass basically whatever he wanted. And so he did. He passed this terrorist or anti-terror law, which as soon as you hear that it's an anti-terror law, you should, be, should have been freaking out. Most people were afraid of further terrorist attacks, which there were going to be. There were other terrorist attacks both being planned and that had been executed in the time since around the world by similar motivated people. But what did C-51 do? C-51 gave the CSIS, the Canadian, I think, Security Intelligence Service, and CSEC, the Canadian Security Intelligence, uh, what is it, C, or establishment, I don't know. Hey. The, the the two organizations in Canada, one is for supposedly supposed to be for spying on the rest of the world, and then one of them is supposed to be kind of spying on us here in Canada. Uh, of course, both of them kind of do both, so that distinction doesn't really hold water. But they, they were given the authority to, to, one, conduct mass surveillance. So this was after the Snowden revelations leaked to the world that one of the things that Canada was doing was taking part in the listening to of phone calls, in the recording of emails, in the recording of uh, everything we do online, in the recording of and processing so that the information could isn't just you know stored on some tape somewhere. That it's actually actionable knowledge of what's going on in our private lives, and so on and so forth. And what C51 did is it legalized all of it. And it legalized the ability of CSIS and CSEC to do everything short of murder, sexual assault, and possibly torture. There was some wiggle room on torture. But this included all kinds of nefarious activity and otherwise illegal activity. You can, And there is precedence for this in Canadian legal history. Uh, if you go back and look at uh, James, James Bond, I mean, James Bond is a fictional character, but it's based on a true person and a true environment uh, in Canada specifically. A Canadian, if you go back to, what was it, Ian Fleming and where he was writing and what he was writing about, again, he's writing about Canadian intelligence and what they were allowed to do and what they were kind of given. And so you can think of CSIS as this kind of James Bond-esque, no-holds-barred, licensed to almost kill 
they probably do kill, but again, that, that part is still technically against the law post C-51. But it also, in addition to legalizing the mass surveillance of Canadian citizens, both private and public conversation, and, uh, and participation in our own democracy, it also did stuff like criminalizing public protest and removing from us the protection of the rule of law and the Charter of Rights and Freedom from secret police interfering with our lives. And that they are able to do this for anything, they, any reason they want. Love Int, the tendency of the NSA employees to use their power to stalk, harass, and basically get their love interests to capitulate because of the absolute and awesome power that knowing everything about the person and all of their family members allows. Again, this has been totally legalized here in Canada thanks to the Anti-Terror Act. There was a book written by a guy named Mitrovica who detailed pre-2015 the kinds of abuses that the intelligence agencies in Canada had been allowed to get away with, in part because there, while there is an oversight that's supposed to be watching over them, the oversight capability of that office has long since been broken. And, and C-51 opened the floodgates for CSIS and CSEC to be doing new things, including not just here in Canada, but around the world, that we have made it legal for them to conduct their own foreign policy, for them to conduct foreign policy up to and including the targeting, harassment, uh, and all kinds of dirty tricks of people all over the world, and to really destabilize both governments and unions and protest groups and churches and you name it if it's out there CSIS can legally go out and destabilize and cause problems of all kinds with that group which again why is this important to mention because that means there will be blowback for things that CSIS is doing around the world to us the Canadian citizenry that there's going to be people that are going to be noticing oh hey why is CSIS assassinating or, or CSEC trying to assassinate or helping people to assassinate our local leaders? Like, what is Canada, you know, what have we ever done to Canada? Why are they doing this to us? Well, again, this is the sort of thing that we can start to be looking for because this is what we have made legal. Another group that is going to be targeted and has been targeted since this law has been passed are the First Nations. And so it is legal for our government to harass to gaslight, to kidnap, to do all kinds of things to First Nations people. And there's, again, it's legal. So we have enabled all kinds of uh, harassment and unfair treatment just a few years prior to a reconciliation project by the, the country at large to try to make it so that we're living peaceably with the First Nations people who have gotten the short end of the stick in so many different ways. And yet we still have this law in the books. We still have this out of control government with our out of control secret police network that is targeting and has a history of targeting in the case of the RCMP, which has also had their kind of holds uh, removed on what they're able and legally able to do. I mean, you, you can go back in their history that they were founded as a response to the, the possibility that First Nations groups may have a little bit of autonomy, right? And so this is one of the groups that cool, is going to be and has been targeted by these laws. Same thing with environmentalist protesters, people who try to stop pipelines, for example, from being built. That they they can be just swept up and removed and treated as if they were violent murderers and terrorists because the law is no longer differentiating between the two. Same thing with people critical of the government of the day, whoever that maybe. Right now it's the Liberals. But tomorrow it could very well be the Conservatives. And it could very well be Trumpists in the future. And so whoever you don't like in Parliament, in, in government, that's who you have to worry about being able to target you for being critical of them and just having your rights taken from them, being having your property taken from you, having your ability to use the, the internet taken from you, and the ability to have people in your life when they get messages from you to be able to rely on that, oh yes, this is actually from that person, rather than a secret police network designing messages specifically to turn your friends and family against you. That you don't have to, in the past, perhaps there were police that had infiltrated protest groups and political parties, including the uh, main political parties in Quebec. But again, this C-51 has legalized all of the dirty tricks in all of the history 
of the, the policing in Canada, of which many have been used. And so it's worth considering how deeply betrayed our country has been by this law and how the, uh, the ideals of what was fought for on in places like Vimy Ridge in the First World War, in places like the Juneau Beach in the Second World War, how many Canadian soldiers had their blood spilled so that we'd have the right to live without a government that spied on us in our private conversation at all times and that acted if we got too out of line and if we didn't perhaps agree with the, the government on that level. Like this is the sort of thing of autocracies and totalitarian governments and yet this is what we have bolted onto our country. Another thing we're not allowed to do is we're not allowed to support and even talk and promote entities that are standing up against and, and using force to, to do good things in the world. Like it's, it's, it's unclear whether even saying that that's possible breaks that law. So for example, the Kurds fighting against al-Islamia, al uh, who are having their children or were for a, a good couple of years in Syria and in Kurdistan, having their daughters kidnapped and turned into sex slaves. And so they fought back, and they actually had some success in fighting back. And they were able to, as a cultural entity, use violence and use force to prevent more of their girls from getting kidnapped and turned into sex slaves. They were able to, to some extent, slow the progression of Dawa Islamia to, from taking over the Middle East. When we go back and look to see you know, what kept them in check, what were the forces that kept Dawa al-Islamia from, from doing more terrorist acts in Canada and elsewhere in the world, one of the factors that is important to note is the Kurds. And yet, if you promote them, if you talk too positively about them in Canada, the Kurds, not Dawa al-Islamia, the Kurds, you can be charged and dragged away from your family in the middle of the night, never to be seen again, and kept from the Red Cross. Again, going back to the previous anti-terrorist act, we have all this, these, these laws that are now working together to make a, a, a giant hole that you can fall into for the most minor of things, for being skeptical of the wrong thing. You can just fall into a hole, never to be seen again. The border has become all kinds of restricted since these kinds of laws have been put into place. And so, but the other thing worth pointing out is that we've, because we've stra strapped surveillance devices in our hands, on our wrists, in our houses, we have Ring now that is going to be feeding live video feed from around our house to the government at all times. Like, we've built this thing that's watching us all, all the time. time. But what was missing was this incentive to actually use that in the government itself to subjugate people and to oppress people. Well, that's what C-51 allowed. C-51 allowed the government to basically target individual people and their family members and to, harass, again, harass them, cause them to lose their job, threaten to remove things like welfare from them. There's almost no limit, again, other than they can't just kill you, right? That, that's one thing they can't do. They, they can't just rape you. They can't just kill you. That's about it. So it's been a disaster for privacy rights in Canada. It's been a disaster for labor rights in Canada because now if you go on the strike in the wrong way, then you can just fall into this hole and be swept up. And again, never heard of, you wouldn't be allowed to have access to the Red Cross or a lawyer or anything. It's just you're, you fall into a hole. And so you can't protest. You can't go out into the street and stop this because, again, merely being out in the street at a, the wrong place at the wrong time, you will fall into this hole. And so this is the probably biggest issue in Canada right now uh, is C-51. And the next thing that we're going to talk about next week, which is C-59, which is we need to get these rights back. The right to protest is fundamental to a free society. The right to publish the uh, free expression and to have access to a newspaper that can then keep the government in check as the, what is it, the fourth estate is critical to living in a free society. But we have stopped being a free society post Harper. Yes, there are still little bits and pieces are, of our lives that are free. This broadcast is still a free broadcast and I haven't been thrown away yet. I worry, I do worry about it. This is a thing that has caused me to lose sleep over the years. In any case, <laughs> it is a, if we're looking at this election and trying to figure out, okay, well, what do we have the ability to change? Well, one of the things that we can change is C-51 because this was from day one, a politicized issue. 
this question of whether we should criminalize strikes, whether we should criminalize peaceful environmentalist protesters. The Green Party had a big problem with this from day one, and the Green Party was in Parliament at the time. Elizabeth May spoke out against this. Bruce Heyer, member of Parliament in Thunder Bay, Superior North, when he was still a Green MP, spoke out about this. It was possible to to vote Green and to get this overturned. Not enough people did, so it didn't happen. Not just the Green Party, though. The NDP, same thing. The NDP spoke out at length about the dangers of the C-51 to our rule of law, to our ability to to live in a peaceful coexistence with the people around us. Because when we're afraid to speak and to talk and to 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 consult with our friends and to discuss issues in our lives, that's when the ability to solve our problems peacefully begins to break down. When we can't even talk about the issues, it becomes more difficult to think through the issues themselves. And it becomes more issues as a group to resolve the issues in our lives. And so you get people doing things that are totally unfair, that are abusing people, both physically and monetarily, and they're without the ability to protest it, and without the ability to write about it, and without the ability to talk about it with people in our lives, including psychiatric counselors, right? There's so many places that I have seen over the years that are like, oh yeah, just if you ever need someone to talk, give this 1-800 number a call, go to this website that has no security whatsoever, and there will be no consequence to you at all if you just talk to us, right? Well, in Canada, our intelligence agencies can and should be expected to be listening when you have a phone call to a suicide hotline. When you go to a suicide hotline website, these things are now no longer off the, the the table as far as things that the government can harass you with. And things that you say in these forums, again, are things that can be used against you in court, can be used against you in the public sphere. It is things that can be used against you to blackmail you. Again, it's it's all out there. It's open for the government and CSIS and CSEC to, to use against you. And so we need to fix this. And the NDP, the Green Party, can be counted on, at least to some extent, to be willing to work with and against the liberals and conservatives that have pushed this anti-terror law to this extreme point, to to begin to roll it back and to begin to put oversight on. And we'll talk more about the oversight that's been put on it later, but I think that's long enough for today. So if you've enjoyed this, this show and want to see more things like it later, send me something on Subscriberstar or Villages or even Bitcoin. Bitcoin is fine. And uh, if you have any Creative Commons music to play, definitely send me a link. I'll give it a listen. And if you have anything you'd like me to talk about or someone you'd like to see me interview or have as a guest on this show, definitely give me a link. I'll I'll give them a ring or whatever. and We'll try to work from there. So otherwise, hopefully you enjoyed this bit of a later show. And I'll see you next week.